change my title. Well, it's an honor and to, to be here among all of you. Um, I come from the Northeast, so I'm kind of, uh, I guess Jim is here from Virginia, but not quite like the whole Northeast megalopolis. Um, to give you an idea of what I confront where I live uh, a long time ago when I was an editor in New York, I uh, worked at Hearst Magazines, and I was invited to an editorial meeting uh, where one of the Hearst sons came, and it was a big mahogany-lined, uh, you know, walled room, and, and they asked the editors that were invited to the meeting, they said, so, you know, we're going to talk about what the magazines need and what the world needs to hear from our magazines. And so, um, said, Lisa, what do you think? Um, to be some good articles for your magazine. So I said, well, uh, you know, more green articles, and I meant environmental. And, and one of the other editors said, do you mean in fashion or decorating? <laughs> so, <laughs> and I, 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 it was really a lost cause. And so I, I've sort of been doing, uh, sort of been the outlier in my world of the Northeast for a long time, so it's nice to be here with friends and to share our work. So thank you for having me here, everybody. Uh, so I did change the title of my piece. It's called Umbilica Umbilicalness, Notes on Affliction and Animals. And this is uh, really a work in progress from my memoir that I am uh, writing. And it's uh, kind of a series of vignettes that interweave because I'm trying to tell the stories of, I said this wrong, uh, you know, a lot of people besides myself, uh, which includes non-human and children. Um, so what I'm going to do is just read you about six of the opening sections that are part of the first part, which is called background. The second part is called foreground. So I'll start with the, and I will define umbilicalness for you um, as I read. So I'll start at the very beginning. Our years, an abstract with horses and foxes. Rescued horses do not, dare I say it, love easily. You can tie them up and force them to pretend they do, but touch them and they will flinch. I am too tired to argue this if you disagree, and many do, and I am used to it. I dwell with horses and have kept notes about their lives nearly 800 pages now since my Icelandic mare and foal arrived. I wanted to know what mattered to the mare, as a mother, that is, since I am a mother, and it seemed I'd missed something along the way, though I wasn't sure what. Around the time the Icelandics entered our lives, my daughter M faints in the spring when we are brushing the Icelandics' dense beige fur, and it drops from them thick as cotton candy, and we throw it to the grass for birds to carry off. The pediatrician says, dehydration. After all, it's an extra warm spring, and it went nearly from straight, straight from winter to summer. So I fill jugs of water for M and bring them along, as it is dangerous to suddenly drop to the ground around horses. That an adolescent can in one day drink several quarts of water to no avail does not stop me from hounding her to drink, drink, drink because I've no clue that inside of M the storms of rare illness are brewing and no amount of water will cure her. While she becomes the focus of my days, I underestimate the resilience of my younger daughter, L, who is being blown down by bullies. M and L are not their real names, but they are close enough. They are how I think of them now that they are older. Their real names are from before, when it was more difficult and from before then even, when it was less difficult, pure almost, and bittersweet now. The instinct not to revisit those places is strong, though I am weak against it. Over the years, the news of chronic illness crashes in and doctors urge us to continue with ordinary things. Oddly, many of them say the same thing when we leave their offices, which is, remember to have fun. I am unsure if this refers to a past that they suspect has not been fun, as in, you have not, up to this point, shown your children enough fun. Or if it is a superficial send-off because they know what's ahead and I do not. Or if it is the typical existential advice given to mothers, of which the deeper meaning is, these years soon will pass. 
At home, I cross-reference fun and illness and discover the doctors worry I will fall prey to vulnerable child syndrome, wherein parents vigilantly monitor their ill children and inadvertently increase the child's risk of developing difficulties with adjustment, depression, anxiety, and friends. I realize then I must make a pact with secrecy or with compassionate lying. I must try forgetfulness in spite of the fact I forget little and the secret already is out. And no matter how many treatments we try in an attempt to bargain with M's conditions, the pain associated with them is a reclusive captor, does not accept ransom. As always, I follow the rules and succeed so well in keeping up the facade of the ordinary that sometimes a strangeness falls like fog over the house, and it's imaginable that it is all a ruse, and we are as we always were, and we know no one. This illusion is, I think, the benefit and the cost of an isolated life. Here within the fences of my horse fields, throwing hay as the birds begin to go silent for the night, I am far from other mothers and close to the lone vixen loping along by me this spring at twilight. Our borders feel porous and clear air. We not so much fought for this day as yielded to it. She hurries to her den and her pups, quarry clamped in her jaw. Because of her, at night, as my daughters fall asleep and ask me if they will get better, I can respond with at least one thing honestly. The foxes came back, and so will you. So the next section is called Three Ways to Imagine Umbilicalness. One, umbilicalness is in the barn when a caterpillar is repeatedly stabbed by a large spider. Black, a spider dips in the caterpillar's soft tissue, injecting venom to dissolve caterpillar's insides. Caterpillar writhes and twists in its, its smooth, fat body. Soon enough, spider notices me shuffling over and releases caterpillar into a comma-shaped slump. Good, it's over, I think, and I turn away to stir the horse's grain, but spider attacks again. Nearing what must have seemed to be the end, caterpillar flings itself into an arch and falls over like a sigh. I know spider needs to eat, but by now I am too long a witness to pain, so I shoo away spider and carry caterpillar to the flowers, where after a minute, caterpillar begins crawling atop the grave of my old mare, the horse who long ago rested her enormous face against my daughter's chests. Two, umbilicalness, while not in the dictionary, obviously is derived from the umbilical cord that nourishes the mammalian fetus attached to the placenta, the source of life inside the womb. Umbilicalness is the state, quality, condition, degree, or instance of this joining of lives. Three, umbilicalness outside of the womb is derived from the meaning of umbilical as a conduit or link through which power, energy, or other services and supplies are transferred. In this way, umbilicalness is the state, quality, condition, degree, or instance of serving as this link, especially to a life that will be or is designed to be ultimately self-sufficient or independent. Typical examples in the OED, or Oxford English Dictionary, include the link between the astronaut and the spacecraft or the deep sea diver and the surface, Additional linked pairs who transfer power or energy between them and up for consideration here are human and human and human and non-human. This next section is called Sketches of My Afflicted, and I'm just going to read you the first three. And after this, it will go into, Lee's will go into um, Sketches of My Horses, but I'm just going to read the first three. Sketches of My Afflicted, Landscape, The Raven's Forest, if there is any land in these parts begging for its life, it is these 90,000 acres of farms, fields, and forests, of which I am guardian of only 10. Still, they feel huge to me and swallow me up like a bear would or a fire. Each day, the sun starts low in the forest adjacent to my horse field, and by the time I'm feeding horses, it clears the canopy when the air smells of old hay and creek water, though the creek is far off. By mid-morning, ravens dive from the forest and swim across the sky and land on my fences and yell at my horses. After decades of disappearance, the ravens gurgling and croaking is a new song around here, and land claimed to exist as a protected agricultural reserve. 
You would think the rules written to protect the reserve, a highly sought after landscape 30 miles north of Washington, D.C., would guard against developers' threats to destroy it. But rules can be argued and subsequently changed by the planning board and native politicians. This is because hidden behind the rules are special exceptions to the rules. The system for protecting the land is as equivocal as a school that claims a zero tolerance policy for bullies, but then grants them extra chances. Brutality, it appears, is relative. Its existence depends on who makes a fuss about it, and we go from there. Those who plan to destroy the Ravens Forest live not in the US, but in Saudi Arabia, and are, in fact, a family of princes who pass this parcel of land from brother to brother. Not even the money offered from the richest man and conservationist in the reserve is enough for the princes. So lawyers are sent on their behalf to attend town hall meetings with the developers, none of whom say out loud what they whisper when alone, which is that the Ravens Forest is an infinitesimal part of the massive body of the Northeast megalopolis. Its time has come to be cut out like a vestigial organ that won't be missed once it's gone. The lawyers know we've less money to fight them than do princes. So we are thrown a bone or two of environmental easements that quiet us for a few years and later are rescinded when the planning board gives us the option to enter the ring again. The princes are ready. They know we will fall first. When M begins fainting then, this is where we live, near royalty we never see, in a reserve in the foothills of Sugarloaf Mountain, an outlier of the Blue Ridge, in our White House in the territory of ravens and owls and other jewels hiding in a habitat wholly unknown to princes. When we arrive, Emma's 11, L is 5. There are orchards down the road and plenty of crops, but I came for the animals, wild and tame, and to raise my daughters around horses, despite my scant experience with them. It's not long before M grows into a skilled rider, jumping other people's horses, and this makes it easier to imagine our land as home to some, under whose thick manes we'll warm our cold hands. This comes true just three months before M's first diagnosis though by then she can no longer ride, and I am left alone to care for the rescued herd we, one by one, take in. Sketches of my afflicted M. We are in and out of doctor's offices too often to count, driving weekly, sometimes daily, to the highways at the border of the reserve that run us to D.C. or Baltimore in about equal time. This makes trips to Children's National John Hopkins, Georgetown University, and George Washington University hospitals about even an effort. Though the opposite would seem true, the more doctors we see, the less clear everything is. As time goes on, I find I am correct that test results and blood markers and an accumulated history give credence to the claim that something is amiss in my daughter. But I am incorrect in trusting that someone can identify it exactly. These are the early years, and who knows, until you know, that there are nearly 7,000 rare illnesses frequently misdiagnosed or undiagnosed, and M's body will be home to three. They'll work against the proper functioning of her autonomic nervous system, her heart specifically, as well as her musculoskeletal system and her connective tissue. The illnesses are identified in words scarcely graspable. Reflex sympathetic dystrophy, postural orthostatic tachycardia, and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. After one or another trip long home from somewhere, wind whipping around me in the barn, I imagine these illnesses as entities that have captured M and collude to hold our over our heads, hers the most, not a death sentence, but a pain sentence for life. Sketches of my afflicted, L. For a long time, L is in the small print under the headlines of her sister's reports until she becomes the news and jumps to the front pages of my mind. Tests reveal she is on the autism spectrum, which sheds light on the shadowy years she was bullied, as well as on her profoundly heightened artistic abilities. Mostly her autism explains her severe sensitivity to sound and her misophonia, a condition in which certain sounds enrage her and which, though it is twice as prevalent in autistics, is so rare it is not yet categorized as neurological, psychological, or a type of synesthesia wherein the brain crossfires sound with emotion. Later, to have her hearing tested, 
I take Elle to an audiologist who is considered the foremost expert in misophonia. He is an older man, patient and grandfatherly. Most of what he explains about the functions of our ears and our limbic systems is too technical to understand. But when he reports that the upper level of L's hearing is near the lower level of a bass or a dolphin's, L lights up. She embraces this kinship with animals, and it seems the one good thing to come out of the testing, that she has a superpower similar to bats she sang to when she was little and they circled over us on summer nights at the barn. Her batness means that in a silent room, Elle hears saliva slide down your throat or your fingernails scrape your scalp. But there is a dark side to her superpower, and it is this. When the sounds of swallowing or sniffling or scratching come from the bodies of those she loves the most, the sounds are transmuted into pressure points felt both inside and on the surface of the body, like strong pinches or pricks. And she responds like a horse tied so tightly to a post it cannot move. Enraged, she breaks away in flight. Evenings, I watch Elle do her homework and see her as the little girl she was before she was so relentlessly bullied and the misophonia anchored in her. Sometimes we turn on a noise machine and play the sounds of waves as if the sea floods our horse fields. I am now acutely aware I swallow numerous times in the space of minutes. When I am near her, I must turn my head and time my swallow with the crumpling of a piece of paper to disguise what I never before heard inside myself. I don't want to, but in my heart, I doubt how long I can do this. Then I whisper to myself, I can do it forever. Then I think, what will happen to her when I'm gone? If she is to live in peace, she must somehow find a way to live without silence and without love. Thank you. After this, it will go into the sketches of my horses. These are all rescue horses, each afflicted in their own way. So the idea is to speak to the idea of brutality uh, you know, in the world. But then also, the next part will be foreground. So it will go more into the notes of the 800 pages of notes that I have single spaced um, about dealing with this on a direct basis, dealing with the horses, dealing with the children, the medical system, and hopefully joy and hope you know, through all this as well. But the, I had to give the background, sort of the character sketches before I could jump, because there are just so many competing narratives. Um, the one that has misophonia is 14, but she's had it since she was about, she started having it right after she got terribly bullied, so around 10 or 11, which I guess I didn't really know that your brain, when you're that young, is highly um, influenced uh, Especially, I didn't know she was autistic, so even more so. Um, nobody knows how you get misophonia, but she has it. So she's 14. My other daughter is 20. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I just changed the title. <laughs> so Affliction is my new title for it. Thank you. Well, that's just it. I didn't for the longest time. I, I, I was here last year and kind of qualified my 
speech, so to speak, because I started to write poems, all that I really had time to write when my first daughter had all the health problems. Um, so I didn't really write any essays throughout a long portion of that time, except for Dark Horse, um, and that's about it. And then now that my first daughter is healed, she's not really, but she knows how to manage her pain. Um, she went to the Mayo Clinic, and she has techniques to manage her conditions. Um, and now I'm sort of wrapped up in the next, with the uh, misophonia with the second child. Uh, but I mean, the, the doctor did literally um, state that she has, her hearing is so far above what most people can hear. Um, and uh, so I actually went online and researched the lower level of bats with the higher level of humans, and she is right there at that cross section. So, you know, the low 20, the, uh, the bats with the 20 hertz, and she's the, the upper level of hers, and she hears that consistently, not just, oh, a little beep, but she keeps tested her. Um, so. She takes pleasure in that part of the batness, but it's, it's to, you know, she likes being compared to a bat, because we do have, you know, bats, and she loves them, but um, it's, no, it's, um, I mean, she's very isolated, she gets, can be very isolated because of it. So she needs noise all the time. No, I, I mean, um, the horses are, like I say, I have the, the $100,000 therapy in my backyard in the sense that it costs that much to build the barn. You know, I'm just saying, I'm just throwing it out there, you know, to have a barn and to have a land for horses. It's, but to me, it's better than going to a, you know, therapist is what, is what I'm saying. Um, you know, horses' hearts, they, there's so much um, uh, research now on therapeutic um, effects of horses, and their hearts are bigger, and their hearts actually send out you probably know this already, living out here in the West. Um, you know, sent, they, they, you actually can connect to a sort of a um, place where the hearts, they hear us, and we can, we can feel them, but we can't. So there's a, they, they offer that to us in the sense of their peacefulness. So, but I should also say that they're not always so peaceful, especially the rescue ones who've been abused, as mine have. So it, it's work to get to that place with them so they'll even let you touch them. So, but mine are all happy now. So um, so that's part of the, the joy of the work will be later to how I've brought them along at this. I mean, I had no choice. I had horses, and I had two kids. And it was either, you know, I'm not going to get rid of the kids, but I'm not going to get rid of the horses either. I wasn't going to let the horses go because um, I had planned on having this life, which was completely changed because of the illnesses. So... Well, when it was time to, for her to go off to college, um, we sent her, we were at the end of our ropes because the reflex sympathetic dystrophy is a condition wherein um, it's a, the autonomic nervous system uh, has, sends message pain signals and the pain never stops. It's, it, it's like nerve pain. It's 24-7. It's, it's, it's seemingly painful. Um, so she could not, she had lost the use of her right arm at, after falling off the horses. She was a jumper, just the cumulative injuries, something snapped. Um, so she, when she was ready to go off to college, and she really wanted to go, but she couldn't write. And she literally couldn't even write her name. So we were trying to get all kinds of accommodations for her and wondering how she was going to live on her own. And I was being told, you can't let her go. You have to keep her home. At the same time, I said her life needs to go forward. So we sent her to the Mayo Clinic, who for a month she lived there intensively with intensive treatments. So she's not cured, but she knows how to manage her pain. Her strength was built up. Um, so, yes, she goes to Sarah Lawrence College. Mm -hmm. So her, you know, she takes medicine for her heart, for heart condition. Um, she has a, the, her connective tissue condition offers other challenges. She's pretty much of a bundle, but, you know, she's a trooper in a spirit. Um, so.
Can you say for anyone? Yes. Is misophonia an illness? It's not technically referred to. There is a directory through NIH, and there are the 7,000, it's like 6,800 rare illnesses and diseases. It is considered so rare that it's not even on there yet. Um, and no one really knows where it comes from. I mean, I've tried to do some research, and I, I can find a lot of material. There's only maybe 15 current research articles, scientific research articles out there. There's a place at Duke University that has a, a misophonia center for, it seems to be happening more with younger people. That's kind of like what's going on right now. So we're not really sure what it's about. The princes will sell, have, you know, are going to develop the land. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they won't accept any of our offers for, we have a person in the reserve that wants to, to save it. And, you know, he's a multimillionaire. He, he offered, I think, about $5 million. But, you know, they obviously can make more money building houses 30 minutes north of Washington, D.C. So... No, my horses I have right next to the. You, are you serious? Yeah, my I have ten acres right adjacent to the ravens, what I call the ravens forest, because you know ravens have been historically absent from the Northeast for many many years. Between 1966 and 2014, they just started coming back. 2012, based on my research, and uh, so now that they're you know to me it's a. I know that you have them in the Northwest, and they're common, but they're not common where we are. So, uh, but yeah, no, that land is right next to my horse field, so there will be houses soon in there. Yeah, that's not research, that's just my notes, my journal. Mm -hmm. No, it will be immensely helpful as I go through. You know, I've gone through it page by page. And, I mean, I, what happened is it was started as a journal about the horses. And then as the girls started to have, things started to come up with the girls, then that came into it. So it's now become sort of a crossbreed of medical research, autism, brain research, limbic systems, bodies, horses, nature, you know, all together. Um, and I've been trying to work on this idea for a long time and realized that I really need the journals, otherwise it sounds contrived and concocted because all the real stuff is in there. So that will be foreground, you know, let's sort of take you straight in from where I'm leaving you off here. Thank you. Thank you.